speech and swallowing. But before I get to that, there are a couple of things I'd like to say. First, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Debbie Davis and John Collins, for all their support in making these chats possible. As many of you know, I am about as low tech as they come. Technically challenged doesn't even begin to cut it when it comes to describing my computer skills. So without their help, we wouldn't be having this chat. So I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I might be the voice here, but I've got lots of supports behind me, which is really helpful. Secondly, I would like to thank all of you who have tuned in today, as well as to those of you who listen to the taped presentations at a later, more convenient time. I have received several lovely messages in the past couple of months letting me know that you are finding these chats helpful and enhancing your understanding of Parkinson's. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate your feedback. Some of you have also kindly shared some suggestions of topics that you are struggling with and would like to hear more about in the future. After all, these sessions are for you. So having suggestions like these is very helpful as I really want to address your issues and not just tell you about things I think you need to know. So please keep your ideas and feedback coming. This month, I haven't received very many questions from you. And I just want to remind you, as Debbie has just done, that if you have questions, either related to today's topic or, indeed, any questions that you would like me to answer, Please send them, again, I'll repeat, to debbie.davis, that's D-E-B-B-I-E dot davis, D-A-V-I-S, at parkinson, P-A-R-K-I-N-S-O-N dot C-A. Or, if you don't have access to a computer, after today's session, you can reach me at 416-227-3375, or the 1-800 number, which is 565-3000, that's 3000, again, to extension 3375. You can do this at any time during the month, and I will definitely include your questions in my next chat. I hope by now that I have helped you to understand that you can live well with Parkinson's, and that the ingredients that need to go into this recipe in order to make that happen are, one, having a doctor who specializes in movement disorders and understands this very complex medical condition, and two, you, an informed patient who, are not, who not only has a clear understanding of the symptoms of Parkinson's, but just as importantly, is willing to take the necessary steps to deal with whatever challenges and obstacles Parkinson's puts in your way. An experienced physician and a prepared patient, that's you, are essential to ensure that you have the best quality of life possible. In the first two chats, I think I've made it pretty clear that Parkinson's disease involves more than one system. As a result, the medications we usually associate with the treatment of Parkinson's, such as levodopa, commonly known as either Stinamet or Prolopa, which help with the stiffness, slowness, and tremors, may not help with other symptoms. So it's very important that you understand not only your symptoms, but what you can expect from your medications and what else you need to know to manage these challenges. I'll now briefly go over what we chatted about in January and February. In January, I reviewed the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. That is tremor, stiffness, slowness, and problems with walking and balance, which occur because of the deterioration of some nerve cells and what we know as the central nervous system. That's the system that includes the brain and spinal cord, I should say, excuse me. In February, I started to deal with another nervous system called the peripheral nervous system. 
and included in that the autonomic or automatic nervous system. As you will recall, I find autonomic difficult to say. So I call it the automatic nervous system because everything under this system happens automatically without us even being aware or conscious of it. I dealt with constipation first, as it is a symptom that many of you have but are often too embarrassed to talk about, and it's a normal body function that most people can take for granted. But for people living with Parkinson's, it can be a problem that cannot and should not be ignored. If you would like to listen to the first two uh, broadcasts of these chats, don't forget that you can also go on our website, go to the link that says PDTV, and then follow the link to Lunchtime Chats with Sandy. That way, then, you, if you haven't listened to the first two or you would like to review either of those sessions, you can listen to them again. That is, if you're willing to do that. So the first of today's topics, swallowing, is another thing that most people can do without thinking. However, at least 50%, that's a high percentage, of people living with Parkinson's have trouble with swallowing. When I'm teaching healthcare professionals about Parkinson's, I start the conversation about swallowing with, how many times have you swallowed today? and I pick on poor one or two unsuspecting people in the audience to answer that question. At first, they look shocked. You know, the deer in the headlights look when they think they should know the answer to a very simple question that I've just asked them. But of course, they soon realize that they don't know the answer because for them, swallowing is automatic and they can take it for granted. Swallowing is, in fact, a very complex motor activity that requires a high degree of muscle coordination. It also requires a wide range of areas in the brain, again, all working in a coordinated fashion, and that is that are responsible for swallowing. So, with everything that you've learned and already know about Parkinson's, is it any wonder why swallowing problems happen to so many folks? I learned long ago never to say never. But this is usually a symptom that can happen at, and, and is often a, a late stage symptom. But as I said, I learned a long ago never to say never. So it can really happen at any stage of the illness. Just because it's a symptom of more advanced Parkinson's, however, for those of you out there who are in fact newly diagnosed, it is something that you do need to know about. So I'm just briefly going to go over what this normal swallowing pattern is so that to help you to understand what's going on. So for example, I'm sitting here chatting with you today and I have a glass of water. Now you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm about to take a sip of it. There, thank you for your patience with that. Now, what basically just happened is that my brain recognized that Sandy was putting something in her mouth. So it automatically sent a message down into the muscles around my throat or in my throat. And what it said to the muscles is, muscles, be on alert. Sandy has something in her mouth. At that point, what happened was that the muscles in my throat moved a little cap that fits very tightly over my airway. I should have told you, you basically have two pipes in the back of your throat. One's called the esophagus, and that's what that's the tube that takes things down into your stomach. The other is called your airway. That's the tube that takes things down into your lung. So back to the cap. So the little cap itself is made of cartilage, just like the end of your nose. But what moves that little cap is actually a muscle. 
So that little cap's job is to fit tightly over the airway. That's the tube that goes down into your lungs. Because obviously, you don't want things to go down the wrong way. That is basically what's going on in your throat when it comes to a normal swallowing reflex. However, with Parkinson's, that normal swallowing reflex slows down. And as a result, sometimes food and liquid can go into the lungs. When the automatic swallowing reflex slows down, drooling is usually the first symptom to show up. Saliva is normally produced all the time, and if not swallowed, it puddles in the mouth. There is a common misconception that people with Parkinson's produce more saliva than those without Parkinson's, but that is not true. People with Parkinson's produce exactly the same amount of saliva as everyone else. It's just that if it's not swallowed down the esophagus, it has to go somewhere, so like it or not, out it comes. Some people have significant swallowing problems, but may not recognize them as such. I will list some of those symptoms now. See if any of these are familiar to you. Coughing or throat clearing during or immediately after consuming food or liquid. Episodes of food or liquid going down the wrong way. Example, feeling like you are all choking. Food gets stuck in the back of your throat and you need a drink to wash it down. An increase in saliva, or what seems to be an increase in saliva, or thickened mucus that is like saliva, but it's much thicker. Maybe it takes you a long time to finish eating. Any difficulty with swallowing your pills? Unsignificant, unexplained I should say, unexplained and significant weight loss. If you answered yes to any of these symptoms, then you have a swallowing problem that should not be ignored, as a minor problem can become a major problem as your Parkinson's progresses. It is important to understand that the same slowness and rigidity that affects the muscles in your arms and legs also affects the muscles in your throat. The difference is, you can't see your throat muscles, so you may not be aware of the danger lurking there, as food and liquid may pass into your lungs instead of moving down the esophagus into the stomach. This, if this happens, it's called aspiration, and people who aspirate food and liquid are at a risk of developing aspiration pneumonia, an infectious process that makes breathing difficult and is very serious and can actually lead to death. I don't want to be scaring you all of, all of you out there, but this is and can become a very serious problem, and I would be remiss if I didn't emphasize this. If you have any of these kinds of difficulties with swallowing, please talk to your doctor as soon as possible. If your GP feels that your swallowing difficulty poses a risk of aspiration, he or she will very likely refer you to a speech pathologist. Now that may sound a little strange, but it is actually speech language pathologists who have experience in swallowing dysfunction as well as speech, and that is to whom you will be referred. This in turn, in, in order, this in turn will need to be assessed with you, about your particular problem and will be addressed as quickly as possible. There are some tips, however, before you get to the speech-language pathologist, and if you do feel that you have a swallowing problem, that you can do to help yourself. I do have a list of these, so if you would like them, later on you know the email address and the phone number to, to receive this list of tips. One is have an iced 
soda drink beside you at all times when you're eating. The cold and the bubbles provide a cue to your mouth and throat muscles to swallow. Take frequent sips between bites of food and, if necessary, when you have food in your mouth as well. Take small bites of food and chew them thoroughly before you swallow. Try to eat food that is warmer or colder than the inside of your mouth. The different temperature, again, will provide a cue for you to swallow. Eat quietly at home before you go out to a social event that involves food. This will allow you to enjoy the occasion without fear of embarrassment. If eating takes longer, consider possibly six small meals a day instead of three larger ones. Sit in a straight back chair while eating and have your, tin, your chin tucked down. This helps keep food from entering your airway. Be careful not to talk with your mouth full as using your airway while eating can lead to choking. Also, it may be important to avoid dry cereals, crackers, potato chips, anything that's crumbly. Avoid sticky foods such as peanut butter, fresh white bread, dry mashed potatoes, caramel, sticky buns. Mm, this is all making me hungry at lunchtime, but might be important for you to avoid those things. Also, for you partners out there, you might give some consideration to learning the Heimlich Maneuver. If you want in more information about that, that's a, a life-saving maneuver that is taught by the Red Cross that is very helpful if someone has a choking event. Ask your doctor, as I said again, for a swallowing assessment by uh, possibly a speech-language pathologist in a speech clinic. It, okay. Now, on to speech. The mention of a speech pathologist brings me to my second topic, problems with speech. When I started to work at Parkinson's Society many moons ago and was just beginning to learn about Parkinson's, one of the first things I read was that Parkinson's can affect your voice and your ability to be able to communicate. And I thought to myself, if I'm ever diagnosed with Parkinson's, I'm going to start speech therapy right away. To those of you who know me, this won't come as any surprise. And to those of you who have never met me, believe me when I say, Sandy Jones loves to chat with anyone and everyone who will listen. So the thought of not being able to speak is unimaginable for me and it's definitely not a problem I would ever want to encounter. I even talk when I have laryngitis. So, when was the last time someone asked you to repeat yourself and someone said, pardon, I couldn't quite hear you? Or when was the last time the uh, person with, uh, that you, the person with living with Parkinson's, said to either your husband or your wife, that's the partner without the Parkinson's, you need a hearing aid. My voice is loud and clear. Do you still answer the phone? Do you hesitate to go out and visit with friends and family? Because when you speak, people look very puzzled, no one responds, or they nod politely after you've spoken when it's clear they haven't heard a word you've said. Just as with so many other aspects of Parkinson's, the same symptoms that occur in the muscles of the body, those tremors, stiffness, and slow movement, can also occur in the muscles used to speak. Also, once again, the Parkinson's medications are often not helpful with improving speech, although some people have told me that their voices are stronger when their medications are at the peak of their effectiveness, but the voices become softer as they start to wear off or the level of dopamine 
starts to wane within their system. So, at the risk of boring you again with yet another anatomy lesson, I think it's important for you to understand how speech is produced. Speech is produced by air coming up out of the lungs. The diaphragm has contracted and pushes air up out of your lungs. Across the vocal cords in your larynx, that's just your vocal cords, the larynx makes com complex movements that set the air vibrating, and your lips, tongue, and cheeks shape that air into speech. Understanding that the diaphragm, your lungs, your vocal cords, your lips, your tongue, and cheeks are all muscles. Is it any wonder why people with Parkinson's experience problems with both speech as well as the level of your voice? The voice may become very weak, so it's difficult for people to hear you. Although people with Parkinson's have to put a great deal of energy and effort into speaking, so they feel like they're actually shouting. Sometimes the voice is strong enough at the beginning of a sentence, but then fades as the sentence progresses. It's clear that breathing problems may reduce the volume of the speech. Also, reduced facial expression due to the rigidity of your facial muscles makes speech more difficult to understand. Research has also shown that the muscles in the voice box, that's the larynx of your vocal cords, as well may have a tremor in those muscles, and that can also cause speech problems. A monotone voice, or one that lacks expression, is difficult to listen to. And if one can't speak or articulate clearly, and it sounds like your mouth is full of cotton wool or marbles, people will shy away and refrain from engaging you in conversation. The rate of speaking may also be affected. Phrases may come in out in a rush, and it may be very difficult to slow that speech down. Some people also find that they repeat sounds or words, and it almost sounds like they're stuttering. Also, if you have difficulty generating simple words, we know that word finding difficulty, that's what I call the tip of the tongue phenomenon, word finding difficulty, can often be problematic for people with Parkinson's. Therefore, if you have difficulty finding those words, of course, your sentences will be broken up and your speech, once again, will be hard to follow. If you're experiencing any of the problems I've talked about today, you may want to have an evaluation, again, by a speech-language pathologist. It's not a one-size-fits-all when it comes to speech therapy. We receive quite a few calls um, on an average basis with people asking if we could recommend a, a, de a device so that their loved one could have their voice made louder. There are such devices that enhance voices. They're sort of like a, a mini microphone that one carries around with them. But what I've learned from speech language pathologists over the years but that is not always the answer to the problem because what could happen is that if the speech is very muffled or garbled, <laughs> doesn't sound any better, louder, than it did when it was softer. So again, the reason for speech problems really, necess really is necessary to be investigated. It's important that you discuss your communication problems with your GP and, again, request a referral to a specialist. Time doesn't permit me to go into all of the tips, but here are a few that might help you in your own home if, these are problems, if communication has become a problem for you. 
Make sure that you have your listener's attention before speaking. In other words, don't try to start a conversation if someone is not facing you directly. Speaking to someone's back if you're having speech problems is definitely not going to get your point across. Also, maintain eye contact with your listener. This will help you to know whether that individual is able to hear and understand what it is that you're trying to say. Also, avoid speaking in the presence of distracting background noise. Please don't try to have a conversation with somebody if you have music on or your radio or the TV blaring in the background. This is what I call shooting yourself in the foot for sure. You also may need to speak slower. Make sure every word is clear. One of the things that a speech language pathologist, if indeed your speech comes out in a big whoosh, in a big rush, and you need to slow down your speech pattern, she may encourage you to have something. It's called a pacer board. Basically, it's a piece of wood with ridges on it. And what you would do in that case, if your speech is very fast, and unintelligible, she would encourage you to take your finger across all of the ridges in that pacer board so that you will automatically slow down. You can even do this yourself with your fingers. Take one finger, preferably your index finger, say for example on your right hand, if you're right-handed, and put that finger on each of your fingers of the other hand. So that instead of speaking to put it your audit, your speech will automatically slow down. You can't see what I'm doing, but I'm hoping that I'm getting my point across, especially that there are some tips that you can do. Something else that's important, and this brings our swallowing talk back into focus here, Swallow before speaking to clear any pooled saliva so that you don't spit on your listener. Try to speak louder than you used to, than you're used to speaking. In other words, it may feel to you, because of the amount of energy and effort that it takes to be heard, you may think that you're speaking loudly, but you may in fact not do so. Begin speaking with a topic phrase such as, I would like to talk to you about, to give your listener a cue or a clue as to what it is that you're trying to say, so that even if they can't catch every word, they will at least get the context of what it is that you're talking about. Also, it's very important to try to plan important conversations that you want to have during a time when you're feeling your best. In other words, if indeed your medications, when they're on and that is your best speaking time, ensure that that's when you start those important conversations. Again, I have handouts on speech and voice and swallowing problems, so please send us an email or give me a call to request this important information. Now I have received a couple of questions, so I am going to deal with those questions right now, and then I'm not sure if any other questions have come in, but we'll take it as it comes. So the first question that I had was, what can I do about drooling? Frequent sips of water or sucking on ice chips or even a hard candy can prompt you to swallow more often. Not too long ago, I guess I'm going back when I say not too long ago, gosh, maybe it was about five years ago, a research project was done by a movement disorder center in London, Ontario, using chewing gum as a prompter for people with swallowing problems. Interesting what they found was that, again, when you put something in your mouth, as I said, um, 
taking frequent sips or water, sucking on ice, but chewing gum has the same effect. When we have something in our mouths, it prompts us to swallow or cues us to swallow. And what that research project showed when the research project was over is that people who had been prompted by swallowing gum to swallow more frequently, actually that effect lasted for a long time after the research project was over. So it might be worth a trying if, if drooling is a problem for you. Also, keep your head up and your chin as parallel to the floor as you can. I know that for some of you, having your head bowed is a normal posture for you. But bent forward heads and chins down often will promote drooling. So try to keep your head up and your chin as parallel to the floor as possible. Also, try to make sure that your lips are closed when you're not talking or eating. Again, the saliva will pool in your mouth, but because it's not coming forward or drooling, again, even the pooled saliva may prompt a swallow. Another question that I received is, how can I prove it, my swallowing in general? Well, I've gone over a few of these things, but I'll repeat these again. Always sit upright when you're eating, drinking, and taking your pills. Chew small amounts of food well and, when, and swallow what's in your mouth definitely before adding more. Slow yourself down between bites of food. Put your fork down in between bites to remind yourself to slow down if necessary. Also, sometimes swallowing twice after every bite will help. Just to make sure that everything that was in your mouth has completely cleared and has gone down the esophagus. Alternate bites of food and sips of liquid to clear food from your mouth and throat. Take one sip at a time. Don't gulp down your liquid or put your glass or bottle, whatever you're drinking from, up to your mouth and just go glug, 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 glug. That can definitely get you into problem. One sip at a time. Do not talk with food in your mouth. As soon as I thought of this one, I thought, hmm, that's what my mother used to teach me. Sandra, don't talk with food in your mouth. So there we go back to that again. OK, a couple of other questions. One is about chronic thick phlegm. Many people living with Parkinson's complain of thick phlegm or mucus in the throat. Drinking more water will help thin the phlegm. Also, drinking carbonated beverages or tea with lemon may also help. Eating or drinking dairy products can definitely make phlegm worse. So it's important to think about if this is a big problem for you, possibly cutting back on things like yogurt and milk and ice cream. I don't like to be the bad bearer of bad news because all those things obviously can be very good for you. But again, there's no question that having dairy products can definitely make more mucus or make that phlegm worse. Another question I received is, is deterioration in speech an inevitable consequence of Parkinson's disease? Should I expect this to happen later? And what can I do to prevent or delay this from happening? As I've tried to stress throughout my chats with you, when you come across a symptom, or when I mention a symptom, please rest assured that if this is not something that you have had a challenge with in the past, it may never happen to you at all. So please don't just sit waiting for the other shoe to drop. All I'm trying to do is encourage you to understand 
what could happen. So then if it does happen, you will be aware of this and have some tools in your toolbox in order to be able to conquer some of these challenges. I would encourage your family and friends to tell you if they notice any changes. Something that I've learned about people with Parkinson's, and that all, and that is that sometimes you, the person with Parkinson's, is the last person to notice any changes. And sometimes family and friends may be reticent to say that they've noticed a change. But in, if you want to prevent things from happening, empower your family and friends to give you feedback if they notice any changes. That doesn't just apply to your speech, etc., but just so you know, they might see things happening and can really help you to be more proactive rather than waiting for you to notice it. Also, this may sound funny, but it's important to keep talking. Talking is great voice therapy, and another wonderful voice therapy is singing. So, regardless of whether you, you sing on key or not, that doesn't matter. It's good therapy. You have to exercise those vocal cords. Just like every other muscle in your body, vocal cords need to be exercised on a regular basis. So please just keep talking and keep singing because if you use it, there's a good chance you might not lose it. I thought this was an interesting question. What is the difference between loss of speech versus loss of language? I mentioned earlier that some people develop word-finding difficulty, which can affect your ability to communicate versus actual problems with speech. So I think when it comes to loss of language, that that is what this person is referring to, word-finding problems. So the difference between word-finding problems and loss of speech is that you may not be able to find the word, or if that's not a problem, you may not be able to speak, either enunciate clearly and or have enough volume in your voice in order to be able to, to be heard. I think I have one more question that's just come in today. And thank you for sending this. This says, did you say you should speak to your GP about swallowing and speech issues to be referred to a speech therapist? Why would you not speak to a neurologist? They are your partner in Parkinson's after all. Ha! Huh. Good catch. Excellent. Thank you for pointing this out. I love constructive criticism, guys. This is really helpful. So, uh, yes, you are quite right. Um, can I say, to, in order to save face a little bit, that maybe speaking to your GP would be a good idea, especially if you can't speak to your urologist in the near future, because um, while I agree that your neurologist is definitely your partner in Parkinson's, no question about that, um, you might not be able to have access to your neurologist as soon as you would like to. So if you don't have an appointment coming up in the near future and any of the issues that I've talked about today, especially with respect to swallowing, um, and you feel that these are problems that need to be addressed sooner than later, you may have faster access to your GP. But thank you, Dennis, very much for pointing this out. You are totally correct. So I guess the bottom line is whatever healthcare professional you can speak to, please do it as soon as possible if these issues are issues for you. So I think that's all for today. Um, those are the only questions that I have, and I didn't have really anything more that I wanted to share with you on these topics. But again, please keep any other questions coming. I would really like to hear from you. 
I just wanted to give you a bit of a heads up. Um, I thought for next, next month, April, as April is Parkinson's Awareness Month, I would like to just go over a little bit of history about Parkinson's disease, kind of where, we, where we've been, where we are today, where we're going in the future. And this will pertain to, um, as I said, a little bit of history about where we've been um, and in the future about some research, uh, exciting research projects that are coming up. And also, I thought that I would also continue on and deal with um, one or two of the other uh, non-motor symptoms, specifically at this time. I'm not sure, but I thought maybe I might deal with some of the cognitive uh, and psychiatric challenges that people have to deal with on a regular basis. So again, I think that's all for today. Thanks for tuning in. And I'll look forward to touching base with you at this time next month. Cindy, one more question. Sorry, oh, before sorry. You sign go, off. sorry, guys. Don't go anywhere. We have uh, another question. Somebody's asking if they can get the list ahead of time um, uh, for future subjects. Will yeah, you absolutely. Be, will you be preparing that? I will. Okay. I know. I, I'm sorry, guys. I was asked to do this before, and I do apologize for that. Um, by this time next month, or maybe even within the next week. I will prepare the topics, the upcoming topics, for future sessions, because that's only fair to you. Because some things are things that you may not be interested in at all. I hope that's not the case with all of the topics I'm going to deal with. But in fairness to you, you need to know what's coming up. And I have not been proactive in planning those. So I've basically just been going on a month-to-month -month basis, but for sure, I'll let you know within the next week or so uh, exactly what I will cover during the course of the year. That's not to say that when I have um, important topics from you that you would like to uh, have me address um, in the over the course of the next few months that I won't uh, that I won't insert those uh, as well. But at any rate, I'll I'll definitely let you know what I have in mind and I'll wait to hear what you have in mind. So thanks again for tuning in today, and um, I'm going to sign off now, and see you next month. Take care, everyone, and thanks for coming along. Bye for now.